I mean, um, so what Gwen asked me to do is to essentially give a, an introduction to this methods course that Brent Goldfarb and I teach at the University of Maryland. And we labeled the class the best, me the best methods course ever, really, because how do you make methods interesting? If we labeled it applied microeconometrics, nobody would show up. And so we, we gave it this fun title, and we're, we're trying to integrate humor throughout. We mean no, uh, there's no political intonations here. We're just trying to make this fun. So but we did, you know, we did make the best course, really. And many people do say this is the best methods course ever, really. So uh, these, are, these are real quotes, of course. Um, so so wh what am I going to do today? So the, I want to talk about the course. And then I'm going to run you through a little bit of a primer of what we do in the course so that you get a sense of what the whole thing is about. And this is a little bit selfish because we're also running a boot camp this summer uh, for two and a half days. And, uh, and so this is a, a short primer of what you would get in that boot camp. Okay. Of course, it's not going to be as in-depth as the, as the full course is. But, um, so so the, main, the main themes of this course are asking the following questions. What, what is causal inference? What are we trying to do here? Uh, and uh, what, what is going to cause bias when we're trying to estimate, let's say, the causal effect of x on y? Right? When are we going to get it right? When are we going to get it wrong? Uh, how can we address uh, these, these potential biases? What are the most common methods that, that we use? When do they apply? When do they not apply? And then the fourth bucket is kind of a catch-all, where we're just trying to, to practice or to teach what, the, what are the best practices in empirical research. Uh, right? And so there's a whole host of other issues that we get into at the end of the course, but the, most of the course is the, is the first three questions. Okay, so let me just briefly describe how I think about empirical research. So I, I bucket empirical research into three, three bins. The first bin is what I'm going to call uh, descriptive analysis. So this is essentially where you're establishing facts. You're looking through your data. You're saying, oh my gosh, isn't it interesting that the average firm size has, uh, has, has grown from, let's say, 10 people to 15 people. Why is that happening? Right? Or you're establishing correlations. You're looking at uh, the relationship between x and y. You're seeing how maybe that's changed, and you're trying to understand why that correlation is, is the way it is. That's what descriptive analysis. Causal inference is, the, is when you're trying to actually isolate the causal effect of x on y. Okay? This is different than descriptive analysis. Descriptive is means standard deviations, correlations, conditional correlations even. Causal inference is trying to say, when can we take that conditional correlation and interpret it as the causal effect of x on y? Right? This is like, this way we're going to be able to answer questions like, what should you do? Should you adopt x? If you adopt x, will, will y go up? Right? If your firm adopts this practice, will it change profitability? That's, that's the essence of the causal question. And then there's a third category, which I think we do a little bit less of, uh, which is forecasting and prediction, which is essentially trying to uh, fit our data uh, to some outcome that we care about, and then we try to extrapolate that into the future, okay? so that we can see kind of what's going to happen as we move forward. We do a little bit less of this uh, in at least the, the strategy community that I'm involved in. But if you, if you go to work at, for example, the Federal Reserve Board, uh, you'll see that they're very concerned about what are the forecasts of unemployment, what are the forecasts of GDP. And so you fit the data to what we, we know it has happened, and then you extrapolate that to what you think it's going to be in the future. Okay, but the, the, the focus of this course is on causal inference, and, uh, and the reason is because it answers these, these questions about what should you do. So I want to start with some should questions that, uh, that are practical and that are real. And so some of you may have heard of this story, but this is a, this is a, 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 real, uh, a real question here. Uh, this is a picture of a guy named Abraham Wald. And Abraham Wald uh, was tasked uh, with reviewing damaged airplanes coming back from sorties over Germany during the Second World War. Okay? And, and his job is that he's going to review the damage of the planes that come back, and he's going to see which areas must be protected even more. Okay, so he's going to have to protect the planes. And so he finds that the fuselage and the fuel system of the returned planes are much more likely to be damaged by bullets or flak than the engines. Okay, so planes come back. He sees that the fuselage uh, and the fuel system of the returned planes are the damaged ones. The engines are never damaged. And so he faces a choice. His choice is, what does he decide to protect more? 
Does he put his effort towards project, uh, protecting the fuel systems or the fuselage or towards the engines? I guess I've got a handful of people here. So what do you guys think? What would you protect? This is a causal question. Should you protect the fuselage and the fuel systems? Should you protect the engines? What's going to be the impact of this choice? So let's take a quick vote. Who, who votes the fuselage system or the fuel systems? Who votes for the engines? OK. Excellent. You'd be surprised. My undergrad's about 50-50 on that one. <laughs> OK. So why? Someone who, I, I guess this is me talking, but uh, let me give you a chance. Somebody want to try to articulate what your, what your rationale is? Why? I'll have you thought I was answering. Yeah, Jared. Exactly. This is, so Jared says that there's something about the planes that are coming back that he's reviewing, which is, which is important in making this choice. So the fact that a, a, a plane was hit in the fuselage or the fuel system, it can still make it back. right? But if it was hit in the engine, what do you think happened? It probably went down. right? And so this is what we call sample selection. right? The sample that Abraham Wald is observing of all of the planes that they send out is a selected sample. And in some cases, that's not going to be a problem. But in this case, you can see it re the, 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 the choice he's going to make depends a lot on how the sample selection is occurring. So there's an old stat, stats paper uh, by Man Mangel and uh, Samaniego in 1984, which actually takes the data that Abraham Wald was looking at, and they calculate the probability that the plane will crash uh, based on a single hit to various parts of the plane. And so it's exactly like you guys said. Uh, if, there is, uh, if there is a hit to the engine, the probability of survival is 58%. If there's a hit to the fuel system or the fuselage, 94 and 97%. Okay. And so you guys are exactly right. right? But this is a question where, this is an issue where uh, if, you, if, you, if you're trying to deal with a selected sample, you might, worry, you might, you might need to think twice about what that should mean for the decisions you're going to make. Here's another example. Oh, sorry, back to Walt's memo, wrong way. Should you wear sunscreen? So sometimes if you Google this question of should you wear sunscreen, you'll find people who are saying that sunscreen causes cancer. Right? So how do you, how do you, how do you get to a place where you can think that sunscreen causes cancer? Well, how would you study that? What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to study some people who use sunscreen, and you're going to have to compare them to people who don't use sunscreen. Right? And so why do you think, you know, so if, you, if, that, was your, if that was your study design, why would, you, why would you come to the conclusion potentially that sunscreen causes cancer? Exactly. Who, who are the people who are going out to using sunscreen? People who spend time in the sun. Right? So of course, the people who put apply sunscreen are going to be more likely to get cancer because they're already spending more time in the sun. Right? And so in this case, we're misattributing the effect of sunscreen to cancer when it's, in fact, something like the duration of time you spend in the sun overall. Right? So these are, these, are the, these, are the, these are the sort of causal questions that we're trying to get at. And you can see that studying them is, is going to be tricky. So just to highlight these points even more, there's several fun graphs looking at the fact that correlation here, like the correlation between sunscreen and cancer, is not, is not causation. So here are some of my favorite ones. On the left, you've got global average temperatures and the number of pirates in the world. OK, so uh, as you can see, over time, the number of pirates uh, has been increasing, uh, and so has the global average temperature. Now, so the question is, do you think that if we were to uh, just dramatically increase the number of recruits to the pirate community, that global temperatures would, would rise even, you, even further? Yeah. yeah, this is it. We've solved climate change, you guys. <laughs> let's just, let's just like, go put all the pirates in prison or make them get office jobs, right? Okay, so. So this is, this is a great one. Here's another one. 
this is uh, this is the um, uh, this is the relationship between organic food sales and uh, autism. And so over time, what you can see is that diagnoses of autism have rose, so has organic food sales. So would you conclude that organic food is causing autism? Right? You can see right off the bat that that sounds preposterous. But this is sort of what we do. These are correlations in the data. Do they reflect causality? Should we ban organic foods so that we can reduce autism? Right, so you can see the, the, the policy, the intervention question is, is the important part here. How do you reduce autism? Is it organic foods? Is it something else? And the last one here, looking at the highway fatality rate and the fresh lemons imported to, US, to the US from Mexico. Right, so here we go over time. We've been importing more lemons from Mexico, and the US highway fatality rate has also been falling over this time period. So if you wanted to reduce fatalities further, maybe we should just renegotiate the lemons deals with Mexico and import a whole ton more lemons, and then we're going to reduce fatalities even further. Right? So, so I mean, maybe these are dumb points, but I just want to highlight that there are very subtle versions of this that we see all the time in our research. It may not be as extreme as these, uh, but they, 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 it persists in, in almost every single empirical study that is not a randomized control trial. Okay, it's a pernicious issue trying to sort out when you can identify a causal effect and when, you can, when you're just studying something that's correlational. So with that in mind, I want to just to talk briefly about how I think about causality. Now, you have to know a little bit about where I come from, because uh, I am now in a strategy and a management department, but I am trained as a labor economist. And so I come from a more econ-oriented background. And economists have been pushing the, the, the forefront on, on causality for a, a long time, especially labor economists. And so a lot of my work deals with, with workers and people. So if I come up with examples, that's probably where they're coming from. Okay? But, uh, I, but I want to bring in this, this potential outcomes framework that I think really clarifies the core issues. Okay? So what does that look like? So the question we want to ask here is a causal question. Will a firm adopting X, some practice, right? Maybe it's expanding into a new geographic area. Maybe it's uh, building a new product line. Maybe it's pursuing an M&A, whatever it is, right? Will adopting this X, and let's just assume it's binary just to make things easy, uh, will that increase profitability Y, right? Is it good or bad for the firm? Do you want to do this? Okay, that's the causal question here. So how do, how do we think about this? So uh, you can think about a world where X is adopted. The firm does it, okay? And you track forward in time, and you observe their outcome, and let's call that Y1, okay? So, they've, so uh, this is the, this, Y1 is the outcome when the firm adopts X. If the firm does not adopt X, then the outcome is Y0, okay? So we have two states of the world here. So what is the, the causal effect? The causal effect is the difference in the potential outcomes between these two worlds, right? The one world where the firm did the M&A, the one world where the firm didn't do it, right? And the problem where we're going to get is that we only observe one world, right? That's the problem, okay? So, so this is the causal effect for the single firm, right? Now, of course, we only observe one of these outcomes. You only observe either Y1 if they do it or Y0 if they don't do it. Okay, and so what do, we, what do we do in this situation? Well, so there are three different treatment effects that we generally try to estimate. The first one is what we call the average treatment effect. This is across all firms, what is the average difference between these two potential outcomes? Right, so for one firm, the m and may be a good choice. For another firm, it may be a bad choice. And so we're going to average across all of these to come up with the average effect. The second effect is called what we call the average treatment effect on the treated. Sometimes called the ATT or the ATET. This is looking at what is the effect of doing the M&A for those who do the M&A. So look at those who, who, who did the, who did the M&A. What would their effects have been had they not done the M&A? Okay? Now, this, now, you'll notice the conditioning here. The conditional is the thing that really happened. The subscripts, Y1 and Y0, that's, those are the potential outcomes, right? So we're saying this is the difference in the potential outcomes for those who actually did it. And then finally, there's the, 
uh, the average treatment effect on the untreated, which is looking at, at those who decided not to do the, uh, the merger and acquisition, but what would have happened if they had done it, okay? And so again, the only thing that's changing here is what we're conditioning on. This is the group that, that did it, this is the group that didn't do it. Okay, so the key problem, the fundamental problem, is you only observe one state of the world, right? You cannot do this for, for any single firm. Uh, so either you observe Y1 or you, or you do it and you don't observe Y1. So what does that mean? This means that the following two expressions are, are entirely unobservable. This, uh, the, the average potential outcome from not doing it among those who did it, you can't see that. And the average potential outcome uh, for those who did not do it had they done it. Right? You just can't see either of those things. So what does that mean? Is, it, is this clear? Okay. The cl I think that the key that, that uh, students I'm gonna, these are potential outcomes. So we're thinking about two states of the world. Right? I just wanted to just make sure we understand here. Let, let's, let's clarify. Can someone explain this, word, this to me in words? It's a very bizarre construct, but, but, but it's really important for us to understand what's going on. So can someone just explain to me, what does this mean to you in words? Just to make sure we're on the same page. They're, yeah. Exactly. These are hypothetical counterfactuals, right? Among those who, who did the thing, what would have happened if they did not do the thing, right? Among those who did not do the thing, what would have happened if they did the thing, right? That's, that's exactly right. Okay? Excellent. Thank you. So what does this fundamental problem mean for how we do inference? Well, it means we, we, we have to use what we observe, right? You have to, in some sense, compare people who did the thing to people who did not do the thing. You have to compare firms that went through the M&A to firms that didn't do the M&A. And this could actually be firms, the same firm at different points in time. It could be between some firms who did an M&A at one point in time, another firm who did it at another point in time. Right? But in some sense, this, this, uh, this expression, this is what we have to estimate, looking at the differences between firms who adopted it and those who didn't, because this is what we can observe. So the question is, how does what we can observe then differ from what we would really like to know? Right? We'd really like to know, for example, what is the, the treatment effect on the treated? Right? What is the effect for those who adopted it? Okay? So let's just do a little bit of very simple math here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this expression, and I'm going to add and subtract the counterfactual for the treated group. Okay? So it's going to look like this. So all I've done is I've taken that first equation, and I've uh, subtracted and then added the red here. Right? So notice these are the same things. This is the expected potential outcome from not doing it for the treated group, and this is the positive of the same thing. So, right, so that's just zero. All right? But what I can do is I can then rearrange. I can combine these first two terms, and then I've got that second term. So if I look at that, this is the first term. I've now put it in green, and the second term is in blue. This first term here, this is the, uh, this is the average treatment effect on the treated. This is saying for those who got treatment, what is the difference between their true effect uh, and, their, and their counterfactual effect had they not done that, the merger and acquisition, right? This, this is the difference between the effect for those who didn't do it that we can observe and the counterfactual uh, of those uh, who, who, did, who did do the M&A, but uh, had they not done it, right? So this is basically, you know, if we just take this very simple comparison, we get back something we like, this average treatment effect on the treated, plus this what we call selection bias. The fact that maybe, maybe this, the group of people who uh, did not take the, did not do the merger acquisition, the group of firms that did not do the merger acquisition, or did not adopt the practice, whatever it is, they are not reflective of the counterfactual of what would have happened to those who did adopt it if they had not adopted it. Does that make sense? Hypothetical worlds are hard to describe. Okay, so, uh, so when, when are we in the clear? When do we get back kind of what we want? Do we, if we want the average treatment effect on the treated, when are we in the clear? Well, the comparison based on these observed groups is going to be biased, right? It's going to be biased for the average treatment effect on the treated when the selection bias term is not zero, right? When, when, 
when those two terms are different from each other. Okay? I just want to highlight the crucial thing here is that this is a totally untestable assumption. Someone help me out. Why is this untestable? Why, why, why can't I test that selection bias is zero? Because this term is unobservable. Exactly. Yeah, you can't test it because you can't observe it. Right? And so this is the key, this is the key problem that we face in, in causal inference. Okay? So let's just develop a little bit of intuition here for this. So we've explained it a little bit, but we need to develop a little intuition about like exactly why these things, what, what's the intuition here? And I think, what, what was your name again? Yeah, Tejas. Tejas nailed it, right? It's about counterfactuals. So let me just describe exactly what these mean in, in awkward words, because it's hard to describe counterfactuals. So what this means is that the average outcome of those who do not adopt the treatment is the same as the average outcome of what would have happened to those who actually adopted the treatment had they not adopted it. Right? It's a little bit of like word, word magic. So another way to say that is the untreated group would have to reflect the true counterfactual for the treated group. All right, now when I teach, I teach uh, core strategy uh, to, my, to my seniors, and this is, the, this is the, one of the fundamental tenets of my course is this idea of a counterfactual, which I wasn't exposed to until graduate school. So I just want to spend a, a moment on this and make sure we're all on the same page. A counterfactual is what would have happened. Right? So you should all be thinking about the, the investment you made in coming here and listening to me. The counterfactual could be that you would be at a movie. It could be that you are taking another class. It could be that you're working on a paper. Right? Uh, the counterfactual is what would have happened to you had you not come here today. Right? And, and I hope that whatever that counterfactual is, that what the treatment effect you're getting from this class is going to be better than that. Okay? Uh, we'll never know. That's the thing. Okay? Unless, I, unless I randomly tell you guys to leave right now. Okay? All right, so, so that's the counterfactual. So, here, so let's just go through one quick outcome, uh, following up on the, the health, uh, the, the sunscreen example. So if you compare people who get sunscreen uh, to those who don't put sunscreen on, right? the question is, does this equation hold? How do you think about that intuitively? So you'd have to ask the answer the question, do the outcomes of those who do not apply sunscreen reflect what would have happened to those who do apply sunscreen had they not applied it? So what do, what do you think? So the Teja says, if it's a truly random assignment, it would work. And we're going to come to that point. But uh, is sunscreen randomly assigned in most cases? Yeah. In fact, if you did think that sunscreen caused cancer, would any institutional review board let you randomly assign sunscreen? No. So what would you be left with? You'd be left with the data set of people saying that they use sunscreen and some people who didn't, and you have to compare across them. That's really tricky. OK. So, and I, and I think that the key point, just to come back to it, is that people who don't put on sunscreen are probably not spending as much time outside, right? And so that's probably the key uh, reason that this equation is not going to hold, okay? All right. So what do we do in this class? Well, we talk about two main issues. First, we talk about the bad hombres, which, uh, uh, which is our word for what can go awry, okay? What can happen? that's going to violate this assumption about selection bias. Okay? Uh, and what we're going to do here is we're going to distinguish very clearly in our empirical work between what we think of as the data generating process, which is how the x's and y's and the z's and the w's were actually created versus what you have in your data and what model you're actually uh, estimating. Okay? And what we're going to see is that those don't often align, and various issues can go awry. Okay? The second thing we're going to look at are what we call the Bigley methods. And the Bigley methods are essentially asking the question, what comparisons can we actually make where we think this assumption is likely to hold? Right? Economists will use the following question. Where is your identifying variation coming from? And that's a technical, technical question. The question they're really asking is, what comparison are you making? Are you making a comparison 
where this untestable selection bias uh, assumption is likely to hold. Right? That's all these methods are doing. They're just isolating specific comparisons, and they have different ways of doing so. Okay? So, uh, so the key issue, which Tay just mentioned as a good baseline, is that randomization solves this problem. Right? Why does randomization solve this problem? Because if I can randomly assign sunscreen to you, if I tell you to use sunscreen, you have to do it, and I tell Gwen to, to not use sunscreen, then what we're going to observe is that the use of sunscreen is totally independent of all characteristics of the individual because it was randomly assigned, which means that people who had a proclivity to spend time in the sun, maybe now they're not going to use sunscreen because I randomly assigned them not to. And some people who do have a proclivity are going to be asked to use sunscreen. Some people who, have, who, who are disinclined to be in the sun, some of them are still going to have to put sunscreen on. And some of the people who are disinclined are not going to have it. Right? But you can see, so we're going to separate out all of the characteristics that are now everything is going to be independent of whether you use sunscreen or not, including your, your potential outcome from not using it. Right? So that's the, key. that's the key here of why randomization works. But of course, as we just talked about, experiments can, one, be costly, they can be unrealistic, and they can be unethical. Right? And so there are key issues here when experiments can be great, and they're not always feasible. And so most methods in causal inference basically try to isolate comparisons uh, between, p between places where x is effectively randomly assigned. So without, even, without actually randomly assigning it, the experiment is, the, 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 the method is trying to basically isolate a situation where we do have an experiment. Okay, so that's the basic idea here. So the three pillars that we use in this course, there's three pieces that come together. The first one are Mon Monte Carlo methods. I'll describe those in a moment. Uh, Monte Carlo methods basically allow you to distinguish between the data generating process and the estimating model. The second part are the bad hombres, and I found this great uh, Nintendo game called Bad Hombres, uh, where, they, where they, they put President Trump's head on there, uh, which I thought was really interesting and funny. Um, and then we have Bigley methods, right? So the hammers that we're going to use. Okay, so, so uh, sorry, excuse me. So let me just talk about each of these briefly, and then we're going to do a little bit more, more detail. So what are Monte Carlo simulations? I didn't learn about these in graduate school. I've sort of picked it up since then. And this is really uh, the, my, my colleague, Brent Goldfarb, who brought these into our course. And I think they are a tremendous asset. And so I want to talk about how to use them. And I'm not going to go too in-depth here. I'll show you the results from, from doing it, but I want you to understand how they work. Okay? So a Monte Carlo, what's the definition? It's a basically a simulation. Uh, it's a mathematical technique that generates random variables for creating and evaluating statistical models. Okay? That's, that's a lot of kind of like mumbo jumbo. So what, what, do we, what do we mean here? The key value of a Monte Carlo simulation is that you create the data yourself. You create the, the x variables, the y variables. You create how they're all related to each other. So, so you know the truth. You know exactly how they're all connected. But what you can do then is then you can create deviations from the truth. And you can estimate models where you've now created certain problems. You've created, for example, selection bias in various ways. And you can see when the selection bias is going to be bad and when it's going to be good. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, all the bad hombres with Monte Carlo methods to see when, when, uh, uh, when, the, uh, when the bad hombre is going to hurt us and when it's not going to be so bad. Okay? Yeah, yeah, it could be. I mean, I think what you'll see is that for our purposes, uh, we're basically going to do very simple econometric theory combined with, with simulations where we know the true data generating process and we know violations of that data generating process. And so 
I, I, I think that the points that you're raising are not, uh, they're not going to apply necessarily here, but let's come back to it when you see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. So, I, I, I don't think that's ex that that. That's not quite my understanding. So the question is, uh, is, is Monte Carlo system, or Monte Carlo simulations, are they narrow in the types of processes they can model? I think w with Monte Carlo, you, 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 you get to decide exactly what that process looks like. They're useful in testing deviations from uh, a typical model. So if you want to know, for example, whether a particular estimator works really well, you'd like to set up a, 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 a situation uh, where, you know, the, uh, maybe the situation where it's not going to work very well, and then a situation where it is, and you can test, because you know what the truth is. Um, let it, let's come back to it if it's not if it's not clear by the end. Okay, okay. So the bad hombres in this class that we're going to talk about: bad controls, omitted variables, simultaneity, measurement error, and sample selection. There are other bad hombres. There's colliders, uh, which we see as a variant of bad controls. And so we talk about each of these in the class. And and uh, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about what each one is in a moment. Uh, the Bigley methods that we talk about in this class. We talk about natural experiments and difference and difference models. We talk about fixed effects and panel models. Um, uh, we talk about instrumental variables. Uh, we talk about selection, Heckman selection models, uh, mechanical instruments. Uh, we talk about diff, uh, regression discontinuity models. We talk about matching models. And I'll just say this, just because it's, it's important to say this publicly. Uh, matching, at least in the management literature, has taken on, has become kind of the de facto, if you can't do anything, you do matching. And I just want to highlight that matching doesn't actually solve any of the bad hombres. It's not, it's not really an identification strategy. It's not, I mean, it, it is a, it's a method to try to compare, to make sure your, the treatment units are comparable to the untreated. But it doesn't resolve any problems of omitted variables. It doesn't resolve necessarily any problems of simultaneity, measurement error, any of those things. And so I put it here because it's important to know that, uh, how it works. but. Um, it is not actually a bigly method in the sense that these other ones are actually going to get us back to a causal estimate. Okay, I'm happy to talk about that further, but I just want to say that for the people watching at home. <laughs> okay, so my goals for today. So I want to introduce the course. I'm going to summarize briefly how each bad ombre hurts you, okay, how it could go awry. And then what I'd like to do is walk through a simple, simple econometric theory of how just one bad ombre. Well, we're going to go with omitted variables today because it's sort of the, the, one of the easier ones. Uh, and we're going to talk about how that causes bias. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to test our very simple econometric theory using Monte Carlo methods. I'll show you how exactly that works. And then we're going to walk through how one Bigley method, instrument of variables, which is probably the most commonly used method, uh, may or may not resolve this bad ombre. Okay? And we're, again, we're going to use Monte Carlo methods to do this. Okay? So, so here's what I hope people take away from this course overall, and hopefully from the boot camp, which I'm not so subtly advertising for at the moment. Right? So hopefully you understand what can go wrong in causal inference. You're trying to estimate the causal effect of x on y. What can go wrong here? Right? And here we're thinking about what's the difference between the estimated model and the data generating process. Okay? The second thing is that we hope you understand which methods can help resolve which bad hombres and when. And the, really the important comparison, the, the important idea here is what is the identifying variation with your given method? What comparison are you making? Right? That's the key idea. The third part, it just goes, is essentially that we're teaching you this tool of how to use Monte Carlo methods. Now, we're going to use them in this very particular way, but you can use Monte Carlo methods at any point in time. If a reviewer comes back to you and says, oh, well, in a, in a system where you have simultaneous equations and you've got measurement error, then this and this is going to happen. And you, what you can then do is say, well, you may or may not be right. I don't know, but I'm going to build a model uh, in this Monte Carlo method, I'm going I'm to apply exactly the situation you're telling me about, and I'm going to check whether you're right or not. And so this is a tool that can really be applied to any particular econometric problem that arises. 
Okay? The side benefit of, of using Monte Carlo methods here is that you recognize that really when you have one data set, you get to estimate one point, one parameter in a sampling distribution. And if you had another, another random draw of that same uh, data from that population, you would probably get a different point estimate. And if you had a different one, you get another point estimate. So sometimes you can get extreme point estimates just because you got a weird draw of the data. Right? But you never know because you usually only get one draw of the data. So there's a little humility that Monte Carlo methods teach us. And then finally, we're going to teach other methods, uh, uh, other kind of uh, issues in, uh, in, in empirical work and hopefully learn some best practices. So these include how do you treat standard errors? So if you can talk about inference and p-values, how do you think about standard errors? Uh, should you cluster them? Should you use wild bootstrap? Should you use you know, all these various inference methods? Uh, we love talking about inf interactions and nonlinear models. I see this all the time as a reviewer and as an editor that um, people will present a logit model or a probit model with interaction terms in it. And they will interpret those interaction terms. But the, the significance and the, and the, the, of those interaction terms actually don't mean anything. Because the nonlinearity of the model makes it such that every, uh, the, 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 the interaction here is dependent on every value in the data, not just that term. So uh, there's a several papers which talk about how to do this. And it's not common in management at all for the people. <laughs> they, they don't know it. And then we, talk, we do a lot with graphical techniques. How do, you, how do you visualize your data? How do you see your data? Right? How do you know what's going on? And there's much more, but this is kind of give you a sense of the other stuff we do in this class. OK, so let's talk about the bad hombres briefly. And then we'll get into omitted variables. So uh, the bad control. So what is a bad control? This is the easiest bad hombre. This is, the, this is the easiest one to solve, because if you're running a model and you've got controls in it, the way you, the way you resolve this one is you just don't control for it. That's the easiest thing to do. OK, so the basic idea is that a bad control is an outcome of the treatment that you care about, right? Now, that has to be correlated with the outcome of interest. So the, the classic example of a bad control is uh, if you're thinking about discrimination against women in the workplace, and, and you're curious of whether there's a, uh, if women are paid less than men. OK, so you run, you look at a, you know, you get a sample of data you, within maybe several firms. Uh, and you have earnings of women, you've got earnings of men, and you run a simple regression, and you find that women earn less than men, right? So, okay, we know that that's, that's, that's been borne out. Uh, so, but what about other controls in the model? Now, one control you might naturally think about is like, oh, we should make sure that we're comparing men and women of the same occupation, right? It doesn't make sense to compare men and women, and one, one women, woman is a, uh, a salesman and the man is a, is a manager, like what is that doesn't make any sense. So let's control for occupation, right? And so what's going to happen when you control for occupation? When you compare people of the same occupation, what's going to happen to that wage gap? It's going to shrink, right? Exactly. Now, should you control for occupation? If you, think that, if you think there's discrimination at work and that's what's driving this wage gap, should you control for occupation? Sounds sensible. What's, what's the problem? Any ideas? Yeah, discrimination could change which occupations you're in. Maybe the, maybe the margin on which discrimination is occurring is that women don't get promoted to the managerial ranks. So the reason that m men earn more than women is because they're more likely to get promoted to a different occupation. Right, so if you're trying to understand uh, uh, whether you know, women are paid or whether women are discriminated against, you don't want to control for occupation because that is on a margin on which discrimination occurs. Does that make sense? So you want to estimate the full effect of, of this discrimination, so you don't want to control for occupation because you want to allow women to move uh, 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 up and down these jobs. Okay. So, that's the, so that's a bad control. Okay. Now, you learn, so a bad control is essentially a mediator in the way I think about it, right? Occupation is going to mediate wages. You don't want to control for, uh, for, the, for the mediators, but you can test mediation in different ways. But if you want the, the full causal effect, you don't want to control for it. OK, omitted variables. This is what we're going to talk about today. This is when the relationship between x and y is not necessarily real. It's driven by some third variable that you can't, you can't observe in your data set. OK, we'll talk more about that later. We talk about simultaneity. This is one of my favorite ones. This gets back to the question of how do you how do you create a Monte Carlo simulation where you have a simultaneous relationship? It's tricky because there's some dependencies there. 
Here you got x causes y, y causes x. You can still do it. Um, uh, the econometrics are a little bit trickier here, but we can, we can definitely do it. And uh, uh, we're going to leave that one for uh, after class if we want to. Measurement error. Now, this is an important topic, I think, in management research because we have a side of management who is really focused on, on measurement, especially the organizational behavior folks. Does your measure actually match the construct? How closely does it match it? And so what happens when you're mismeasured? Right? What happens if that, the mismeasurement is correlated with other things in your model? Okay? And so this is going to cause several issues. What happens if the mismeasurement is in the, uh, the control variables? What if it's in your variable of interest? What if it's in the dependent variable? What happens? So there's a lot to say about measurement error here, which I think will resonate with, with that community and hopefully may, have, we bring everyone together in understanding them. And finally, we have sample selection, which is coming back to Abraham Wald's issue, which is that the sample of data that you have is not a random sample of the population. Right? Abraham Wald's sample of planes were those that came back. They were not a random sample of all the planes that were sent out. Right? And that was the problem. Okay? So in, in class, we deal with all of these. All right? um, but we're going to talk about omitted variables today. Okay? Because in some sense, this is maybe the most intuitive. But let's talk about, let's talk about it. Okay? So what is an omitted variable here? So uh, I'm going to use these directed acyclical graphs to give us a little bit of understanding. Uh, of, of, of how these works without showing a lot of math. We are going to get into some math, but, uh, but I would like to start with these so we make sure we understand. So here we've got three, three variables, x, y, and z. And, uh, and so you get a data set, and I'm using here the, uh, the white box to mean it's unobserved in your data set. So in your data, all you have are x and y. You don't have z. Okay? So the question is, how do you think x, y, and z are all related to each other? Right? What is the true data generating process? Right? How are they connected? And if the data generating process looks like this, then you're, then you're going to be in trouble. Okay? So in this situation, let's think about the skin cancer example again. Maybe you'd like to know about uh, sunscreen. So X is sunscreen. Y is, the, y is the likelihood you develop skin cancer maybe by the time you're 50 or 60 or whatever it is. Okay? So uh, there's, there's likely a direct connection between X and Y. Right? At least we think so, uh, hopefully. Okay? But what, what, what could Z be here? Z is something that affects the likelihood of sunscreen. That's the Z to X angle. And it also is going to affect the, uh, um, the likelihood you get skin cancer. So can anyone think of a Z in this particular example? We've talked about one already, so we could just go with that one. Exposure to the sun. Right? How much time do you spend out in the sun? That is going to cause, if you're in the sun more, you are going to put on sunscreen more, and you're also going to be maybe more likely to have cancer. Okay? So if you had a data set like this, you would want to make sure that you could control for exposure to sun. If you can't, it's going to cause you problems. Okay? So now I want to do a little math. Okay? So let's just take this simple graph here and, and show what it would look like in a, in a, simple, in a simple empirical model. Okay? So what you have here are two equations. The first equation is how is x determined? How is the sunscreen adoption determined? Right? So in this case, what's the only thing in this model that affects x? Just z. Right? So that's the first equation. You've got x and z. This v here is just white noise. It's just randomness. It's just some, something totally random. It's going to play a really important role, actually, in just a moment. But it's, it's, for now, it's just randomness. Okay? Now, and what's the second equation? The second equation is what determines y in this model? Right? So y is determined by two things. So you've got the effect of x on y, and then you've got the effect of z on y. Right? And so that equation, that's equation two down here. And there's no, there's no interactions or anything. This is, the, this is like as simple as we could get. Right? OK, so what I want to do here is, uh, is recognize that in your data set, you can't observe z. You can't observe exposure to the sun. So what you're going to do is you're going to run a regression where you look at the relationship between the use of sunscreen and the likelihood of getting skin cancer. Right? So you're going to estimate a model where you basically ignore Z. It's not that you are choosing to ignore Z. It's that you can't include it. You don't have it in your data set. Okay? So that's the problem. So what you're going to run is a regression of equation 3. Now, so if this is our setup. So you'll see what I've done here is I've created a data generating process. That's equations one and two. But what you estimate is different. 
right? Because you don't have all the data that went into that data generating process. So the questions we ask here are, first of all, what's the true effect of x on y? What's the true effect, given, given this data generating process? If x goes up by 1, how much does y go up by? What's the, what's the answer here? The, I mean, what's the answer here? If x goes up by 1, right, look at equation 2. If x goes up by 1, how much does y go up by? It's not, it's not a trick question. We're getting into trickier questions, but we got to start here. The answer is B1. Yeah, it goes up by B1, right? So that's the truth, OK? So we would think that sunscreen is probably going to reduce the likelihood you get skin cancer, right? You would think that B1 would be negative in this particular case, right? And so the truth here is B1. Now, you're going to run this regression, and the question is, are you going to get B1? What are you going to get, right? So what's the, so the, the coefficient on x, if you could run 2, if you could run this regression, is going to be exactly b1. You're going to nail it. Problem is you can't run it, right? What's the coefficient on x going to be if you run equation 3, which is what you're going to have to run because you, you don't have the other one? It's going to be c1. And how is c1 going to compare to b1? That's the question. OK? So let's do a very, very simple econometrics. But to do that, I have to back up a little bit and do a little bit of regression anatomy. Okay, so what we'd like to do is run the simplest regression you could run, just a regression of y on x. Forget about the, the, the b1, c1s here. Well, I, I guess I should have used c1 here, but you're just going to run this regression of y on x. Okay, the question is, what is the exact expression for what you are going to get out of this regression? Okay, so you're going to get an estimate here of, the, of b1 here, the coefficient on x. Um, and we're just going to call this, I'm going to use lower cases to reflect the, uh, the estimate. So B1 is sort of the truth. You're going to get an estimate of that. Okay, so how exactly do we get that? Well, there's a simple uh, equation here, which is that B1, the estimate, lowercase b1, is just going to be equal to the covariance between x and y, the, the sample covariance in your data between x and y, divided by the variance in x. And you can go through all the regression anatomy formulas, and this is what you're going to get out. So these are... If you, if you were just to calculate the covariance between x and y within your sample, and you divide by the variance of x in your sample, you will get exactly the point estimate from this regression. Okay? And what's nice about this is that we can then play now with this expression okay, when we have a different data generating process. Now, I just want to highlight briefly, in this course, we try to use only two and three variable models. And the reason for that is that we don't want to get bogged down in uh, in technical matrix algebra. And we want to try to keep this accessible to people of all uh, skill levels who may or may not be comfortable with that level of math. Now, this turns out to be not a super terrible assumption because you can, uh, you can, you, this equation still holds in multivariate formulas. You just have to use this frischois lovell theorem uh, to understand the difference. Has anyone, has anyone heard of the, the frischois lovell theorem? OK, so the frischois lovell theorem basically says uh, that uh, if you had, let's say, um, a control Z, or uh, not Z, let's go with W. You got a control W that's also in your model. What you would do then to do this is, uh, is you would then regress X on W and take the residual. You would regress Y on W and take the residual. And then you would, you would, do, you would put this, do this exact expression with the two residuals. And then you're going to get back the same thing. That's what you would get from regression of controlling with W. So you can basically take any regression and boil it down to two variables, okay, no matter how many controls are in there. So that's why we're going to do that here. OK, so here's the key question. So if this is our data generating process, right? this is how the data is actually created here. But we can't observe z, so we're going to run this regression, equation 3. The question is, what do we get? What's our estimate? So if you run equation 3, we know that the exact estimate of c1 is going to be the covariance of x and y divided by the variance of x. Right? That's, that's exactly what you're going to get back out. Now here's the key. How is y determined? Which equation determines y? The true y. Which one? Equation 2. Okay. So what we can do is plug in the true y right, from our data generating process into this covariance expression. So all I've done here is I've taken this y and I've plugged in b1x plus b2z plus 
this, uh, this random noise term u. Okay, that's all I've done. Now, let me pass through the covariance expression. Okay? So uh, if I pass through the covariance operator, so you, this is the one trick. You have to learn how to manipulate covariances. So if you don't know how to do that, that's, that's going to be a, a pretty, uh, it's going to make this a little tough. I'm not going to go into the background here. But you can pass through the covariance operator. Scalars just come out to the front. And then you can just look at the covariance of the random variables here, which in this case is x, y, and, and u, and v. OK, so if you pass it through, this is the expression that you get. All right? Now, uh, so uh, it's worth pausing for just a moment here. So covariance of x, z, and variance of x. What, is that, what does that look like to you? How, what is that number? That's like, it's close to the regression anatomy, right? It's close to the, the same thing you're going to get for the estimate of C1. So this is like, if you were to regress uh, uh, x, uh, z on x, this is the estimate you would get. Right? So, let, so let me just flip this around, actually, make it a little easier. So uh, let me just, just multiply and divide that term by the variance of z. And then let me just combine, uh, let me just swap out the denominators here. Okay, so you see what I've done? All I've done is I've taken that term, I've multiplied and divided by the variance of z. And then I have, uh, I've just swapped out the denominators here. So I've got this term here, covariance of x and z divided by the variance of z. Now, I've, so that looks similar, right? That, wh what this, this, this is going to be uh, reflective of the estimate of regressing x, uh, z on x. Right? This is what we do in equation 1. This is equation 1. So this term here that's red, this is just going to be our estimate of A1. That's exactly what it's going to be, right? It's just like taking this regression here. OK? You guys with me? OK? Pretty, pretty straightforward stuff. We're getting there. So then if you look at equation uh, 1 here, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to expand this variance of x term. So we know that x, the true x, how is it created? It's created by equation 1 here, right? And so what you can do is you can, you can calculate the variance of x just by passing the variance operator through that equation. And you're going to get this. This is the, uh, the, the variance operator here. So you, the way it works, of course, is you, 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 you take the scalar out, you square it, you get the variance of z plus the, uh, the variance of v plus 2 times the product of uh, the scalars and the covariance of those guys. So this is just the, literally the definition of what variance is for a sum. Okay. So finally, we get to this very ugly looking expression. Okay? Now, what I'm going to compel you is that this is, this is exactly what you're going to get out if you have omitted variable bias in this very simple way. If you run OLS, this is what it will pop out to you. Okay, so let me, let me I'm just going to summarize here the, uh, if you want to take a picture, you can take a picture if you want to, Stan. Okay? So this is what I mean by simple econometric theory. There's, not, there's no, nothing fancy here. It's just you know, covariances. OK, so, so let me just summarize all that without all the crazy math. So here is the data generating process. Right? Here's the, we can't observe z, so we estimate 3. So what do we get back out when we estimate model 3? We get this estimate here of C1. C1 equals the true effect that we'd like to get plus all this other stuff. OK, so the first question is, which of these terms go to 0 as n goes to infinity. Which of them are going to drop out? Now, someone help me out here. Wh which of these terms are going to drop out as n goes to infinity? Like if you had a huge sample. So let's, let's come back here. So are x and u correlated in any way? This is a fun point. x and u, are they correlated? What? They shouldn't be. Yes, exactly. They shouldn't be. Now, in a small sample, could they be correlated? Yeah. This is actually a point that I think is really important. Suppose you have only two people in your sample. And suppose you could even randomly assign which of them use sunscreen. Right? You only have two people. So whoever gets that sunscreen, any of their other characteristics could drive the, f the effects that you find. And so in small samples, this doesn't necessarily have to be 0. All of those other characteristics of the people, all the other things that go in, uh, could be correlated with treatment because you have such a small sample. It just happens to be that way. But as you ramp up the number of people, that's going to disappear. That's going to be less and less likely on average. OK? So this is going to disappear. What's the other one that's going to disappear? 
I can just tell you, because it's not that much. This, this last one's going to disappear, too, because V and Z are also uncorrelated with each other by, by construction here. Now, in, in, again, in a, in a sample, in a small sample, they could be correlated. But as the sample gets large, the, the correlation is going to be 0. OK. But the reason this is important is that this is precisely what you're going to get out when you run OLS. This is the equation. And we're going to test that in just a moment. But this, this turns out to be super important. OK. So the question we want to ask here is, when does it matter that you can't control for exposure to the sun? When does it screw you? When, when are you OK? What kind of intuition can we develop from, from this simple equation here? So, so someone help me out here. Someone want to tell me, what are, what are the conditions under which we get back to the true effect, even if we can't control for z? Yeah, Jim. Ah, if they had equal exposure to the sun. What would that, how would that show up here? That's a, great, that's a great point. If they had equal exposure to the sun. Well, exposure to the sun is which variable here? Z. Z. So if everyone had the same exposure to the sun, which of these is going to be 0? Yeah, the variance of Z is going to be 0, right? So. In this case, everyone's got the same exposure. Z doesn't vary, right? So that, that, that falls out. And if you have a large enough sample, that falls out, you're OK. OK, so you could, you could pick your sample such that everyone has the same exposure. That's one approach. Fantastic. What else? What else is possible here? So obviously here out in the front, B2 and A1. What are these? What's, what's happening here? So if B2 is 0, all of this goes away, right? What does B2 mean, z being 0 mean? It means that sun exposure doesn't actually affect skin cancer. Then we're OK, right? What does is, what is, uh, little a1 mean, being 0 mean? And again, actually, I should say, as n gets really large, this will also converge to the true a1 under our assumptions. But in, in terms of the actual estimate, this is exactly what you're going to get. So, this will also get. So, as, uh, uh, so if A1 is 0, we also get back to the truth. Why is that? Where is, where is A1 here? Yeah, so if, if A1 is 0, what does that mean intuitively? There's no relationship between X and Z. Exposure to the sun doesn't actually change your sunscreen habits, right? Now, that's, that doesn't seem likely, right? In that case, x is, yeah, if, if a1 is 0, then the only thing that determines x is that v term, which is just noise. It's just random, right? Exactly. You guys got it. OK, fantastic. Now, there's one other really, really important one here. In fact, it's so important that I'm going to show it to you on the next page. It motivates all of the instrumental variables research that we're going to talk about later today. Uh, maybe in just a few minutes, because I don't know how much time I have. But yeah. OK. So look at the denominator. If you jacked up one thing in the denominator, what would drive that to 0? Which, which term in the denominator would cause that whole second term to fall out if it was really large? So look at this denominator. Which, which single term in the denominator, if you, if you just like increased it a ton, would, I mean, so if you go, if n is large, these two things drop out anyways, right? So imagine n is large. So you're left in the denominator with these two things, variance of z, a1, variance of v. We'll talk about a1 later. So what's the only thing left in the denominator? Variance of v, yeah. So what does it mean to, to really increase the variance of v? Well, there's still a relationship between x and z. So like, think about this way. X, x varies for two reasons. right? Why does x vary? Why do some people have a large amount of sunscreen and other people have a small amount of sunscreen? What are the two reasons based on this data generating process? 
One is that some people have more sun exposure. That's one reason, more or less sun exposure. That's one reason why you see variation in X. What's the other reason you see variation in X? It's randomness. It's just randomness. So if you increase the variance of, Z, of V, this means you're going to have a higher degree of randomness in X. Right? X will be mostly random. So what you're doing here is you're taking all of the variation in X, and you're saying, OK, X could vary because of Z. It could also vary because of V. And what we're going to do is we're going to make V much more important in explaining X. Does that make sense? OK. All right, so here's, here's what we're going to do is we're going to simulate this exact data generating process. OK, so what do I mean by that? So we're going to take this exact expression here, right? And we're going to put parameters on it. So here we're going to let, uh, we're, going to, we're going to simulate basically 100 observations. So you've got 100 observations that you're going to draw. All right, and uh, when you do this observations, we're going to let z be a normal random variable with a mean of 2 and a standard deviation of 1. Right, I'm just choosing that. Uh, I'm going to let u, be, u and v be normal random uh, variables, uh, both with a mean of 0 uh, and a standard deviation of 1. And all of these guys are all uh, independent of each other. Uh, but in a small sample of 100, they may not be. Right? Now, I've also got it. So I've told you how uh, z is created, v is created, and u is created. I've also got parameters in here. So what's the truth going to be? Let's set the truth at 1, whatever that means. Right? I've got to pick what the true a1 is. I'm going to set that at 3. I've got to pick the true b2, which I'm going to set at 5. OK? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I'm going to do this one time. So I'm going to draw 100 observations. I'm going to set z to be this, u to be that, b1 to be that. And then I'm going to create x and y based off, based off all of those things, based off this equation. Does that make sense? OK, so that's going to allow me to get one estimate when I run my regression. So a Monte Carlo method, it repeats this 100 times or 1,000 times. All right, so now I'm going to draw a second sample of 100. And then I'm going to redraw z. I'm going to redraw u. I'm going to redraw v. And I'm going to recreate x and y again. And then I'm going to run my regression again. And I'm going to get a second point estimate. And I'm going to do this 100 times. Right? That's what it means to simulate this data generating process 100 times. So what that means, I'm going to get 100 point estimates. Right? And I'm going to be able to show you the distribution of point estimates. Okay? So let me, uh, uh, So what are we going to do? So for each, each time we simulate this data, what we're going to do is we're going to run a regression. We're going to run the true data generating process. Right, two. We're going to run it with z as a control because we have z in the data because we created the data. But then we're going to pretend like we don't have it, right? As if it wasn't there, and we're going to see how that how that how we go awry. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to double check our econometric theory. This is the beauty of, of Monte Carlo is that I showed you that ugly equation, right? Let's double check that that equation is actually what we get out. Okay. So in other words, I can run the regression. And I can, I can save what my estimate is. And then I can also calculate it based on the exact formula and the exact terms that I, that I showed you in that expression. And I can see whether those align perfectly. OK? And then we're going to play around with the parameters. What happens when you change the variance of v? What happens when you change uh, all of these things? OK? So let me show you what this looks like. OK. All right. So, uh, so if you understand what we did here, that's, that's everyone on the same page about what we're doing, about how this works? OK. So the true causal effect of, of, uh, of x on y is 1. right? That's, a, that's the truth. We built that into the model. And so we know that's true. Now, uh, if you were to run the true model, right, including z as a control variable, you're going to get a distribution of estimates. right? You get a distribution of estimates. Why, why aren't they all precisely 1? The truth is 1. Why are they not all precisely 1? Yeah, it's, be, and it's also because we have a small sample, right? In, the, in a small sample, all of those terms uh, uh, also are not perfectly estimated, because there's these correlations between the error terms and these small samples, which would go away if n jumped up. So if I, if I showed you this graph here uh, with an, of an observations of 1,000, this, this variance would all shrink quite a bit. The whole distribution would, would be really narrow. Okay? That's what I do with 100, because otherwise there's just not much variation. Okay, So 
you can see here, are we centered mostly on the truth here? This is the distribution of our 100 estimates. Are we centered on, on one? We're pretty close, right? Now, sometimes you will get a, a, a pretty bad estimate, you know, closer to 0.7. Sometimes you're going to get closer to 1.25. Now, just keep in mind, do you know when you're running that model, do you know what the truth is? No, you have no idea. You could have, you could have got the extreme outlier. In fact, that's why your p-value could be so low. Uh, you never know until you get more data and you do it again. Right? So, so this, is, uh, this is the value of Monte Carlo seen that you, you, you only get one draw from this distribution. Uh, when you're doing actual work, but here we can we can see that um, what the whole thing looks like. Okay, so now what do we get when you don't control for z, right? You do the same thing, but you don't control for z. Here are the hundred estimates. So here we're going to get an estimate of 2.5. That's going to be the the average, and that's because if you take n to a to a uh, if you go back to the, the equation, the ugly equation. If you if you take n to a million infinity, uh, that whole expression given the values I chose, it goes out to 2.5. Now, again, do we get 2.5 every time? No, we don't. In fact, we never will, right? unless, unless you actually uh, get n to get super, super large. OK? Now, so clear, are we biased here? We are. The truth is 1. We've estimated the effect is 2.5. Right? So this is the issue. So the question is, now what can we do to get us back to 1? Right? So here's, here's uh, uh, first, before we do that, I want to double check that my, my estimates are correct, that the theory that I just showed you is absolutely 100% correct. Okay? So, what I, so here's, again, the data generating process. Here's the equation we run. This is the estimate that I showed you that we're going to get, okay? using all of the characteristics from the data generating process. So what I'm showing you here are 10 estimates from uh, 10, 10 different simulations. Right? And so the C1 hat, this is the estimate that you get from the regression. Right? Now, the, 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 the first column, this is employing this formula, where within the sample that I've drawn, I'm going to calculate. So I know B1, that's fixed, is 1. I know B2. I have to calculate what the estimate of A1 is. I've got to calculate the sample variance of Z, the, the sample covariance of these things. And I calculate all of these for my sample, and I plug them into this equation. That's what I call C1 hat backed out. Right? And so what you can see is that they're identical. Right? So this confirms that our theory is right. This tells us that, that I'm not crazy in how I did this. Right? This is exactly what OLS, uh, ordinarily squares, is spitting out at you. Okay? So that's, that's the nice thing about Monte Carlo methods. You, you can double check yourself. Okay, so here's, here's what I think is the, one of the key points that I want to I uh, get to. So I, I showed you that the variance of V is really important, right? Because it determines the randomness in x, right? And when x is more random, we get to the truth. So let's just test that. So what you can do in Monte Carlo is you can start changing the parameters. So I showed you. Uh, so, so here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to vary the standard deviation of v. So v was normal, normal zero one, right? So let me increase that one, the standard deviation, to five, to ten, to a hundred such that v varies a lot more. And let's now rerun it for all of these different levels of the standard deviation of v. OK? So uh, I've sw I have switched the columns because I'm an idiot. But so here is, this is the true model again. So, uh, and now what I'm doing here is the, co the, the titles here represent the standard deviation of v. So top left is v equals 1, v equals, uh, standard deviation of v is 1, standard deviation of v is 5, 10, and 100. So what do you notice here on, the, on this right panel? What do you notice? Are we still centered on the truth? When does it get better? With, with large variation. Yeah, this is, if I was to show you a, a formula for standard errors, uh, you would see that the more variation you have, the more precise your estimates are going to be. So this is what you would expect. Yeah, Jim. Exactly. Exactly right. So this is, this is the key, though, right? So here we start when the variation of v, uh, variation, uh, standard deviation of, of v is, is, is 1, we get back to 2.5. That's what I showed you before. Now, what happens when we increase the standard deviation to 5? What happens to the distribution of estimates? We're moving which way? Closer to 1, further from 1? Closer to 1, right? And we get all the way up to the standard deviation of v is 100, and we're basically 
we're right on one. Right? And Jim's exactly right. What we're doing is we're washing out the variation in x caused by z. It's being swamped by the randomness. OK? You guys with me? All right, how much time do I have? I have 50 minutes. I'm going to skip the next thing because it's a little bit less important. I think this is, so this is, so what, what, what should be your takeaway then here? When is the problem of omitted variable bias, and when z gonna, going to go away? When x is mostly random, OK? Hold that thought in your head. OK, so the thing I'm, I'm not going to show you here is what happens when you change a1, because some weird stuff happens that you wouldn't think. OK, and sometimes a1 can actually uh, exacerbate the bias. Sometimes it can reduce the bias. And there's a very simple formula that pops out, and, uh, but I'm not, I don't have time to go through it. So let's talk about, uh, oh, I'm practicing. OK, so let me just run. We don't, we're not going to have time to go through these examples. I think you guys have got the picture. But I just want to revisit the, the summary here. Any study which is, does not have random assignment almost certainly suffers from omitted variable bias, right? Because we can never control for everything that affects x and y. Okay, so how can you identify the most important of the variables? If you're doing research, how do you think about this? So here's how I think about it. The question I ask myself is, what could cause x and y to both change? Right? What is something that could cause x and y? Those are the things you've got to be concerned about. Sometimes you'll hear in seminars, people will say, well, couldn't your results be driven by whatever it is? That's an omitted variable concern. Right? So for each, uh, so then I had some fun examples. For, every, for each of these relationships, I thought we could come up with a list of omitted variables uh, uh, so that we could at least think about it. So let, let's, just, let's just run through. I'll just, let's just do one of them because it's fun. Okay, so suppose you want to know whether or not you should replace your CEO. Right? You think about replacing your CEO. So the question is, what's the impact of replacing your CEO on firm performance? Right? So ideally, you'd like to just randomly replace some firm CEOs and not others. That's not, that's not possible. Right? So what kind of omitted variable are you going to be concerned about? You're going to have to compare firms that, com that replace their CEO to firms that don't. Exactly. Why would a firm replace their CEO? They're struggling. Why would a firm not replace their CEO? They're not struggling. Exactly, right? So you would need to have some measure of struggling to control. And there's many others that you could think of, but that's the most natural one. Okay, so and there's, uh, there's other fun ones that you could think about, but this is going to arise in all these kinds. Okay, so in my last uh, 15 minutes, I want to talk about uh, one method to resolve omitted variables, which is instrumental variables. Okay, and so uh, what I've done here is I've taken our, our previous DAG and I've just added a new variable, W. Right, and so uh, we still have the problem that Z causes X to change and Z causes Y to change, and if you can't observe it, and you just run that old regression, you're still screwed. But now, there's a fourth variable, w. And now, what if w affects x, but doesn't affect y any other way? Right? So what, what we would call w an instrumental variable. Okay? And how does it work? Well, x can vary for three reasons now. right? So how can x vary? First is it's just idiosyncratic randomness. The second one is that uh, z changes in z cause x to change. That's the bad variation that we don't want. But then changes in W can also cause X to change. Right? So we've got three reasons X can change now. Okay? What does an instrument do? The basic idea here is to isolate the variation in X that comes from W. Right? So we want only the, w, the variation X caused by W. Okay? And so when you, when you look at a classic instrumental variable estimator, the way it differs from what, what we showed you uh, before is, this very, again, a very simple formula. A very simple IV estimator is going to look at what's the covariance between W and Y divided by the covariance between X and W. Okay? So the way it works is think about it this way. How, does w, how do changes in W affect Y? Only through what? Only through X. Exactly. So if I observe that W affects Y, I'm going I'm to see that W causes Y to change. And if I can figure out then that those changes are only caused by changes in X, then I can back out what the effect of X on Y is. That's the idea of an instrument. Right? So let's take this simple graph now, and let's put, put it into our equations. So all we've done is we've got the exact same setup, but we've now added a W to the first stage. 
because w now affects x, right? Notice, and this is, this is the crucial part, there's no w in the second stage. w does not affect y directly or indirectly through any other way. And this is the key. This is the key to instrumental variables. This is called the exclusion restriction, the fact that w is not in the second stage. Okay, so how does regression, how does instrumental variables work? Three steps. The first step is you regress x on w. Okay, so you're going to run a regression of x on w. Remember, you cannot, you can't observe z, right? So you're going to run, a, you're going to run that that uh, equation number one, but without z. That's regressing x on w. And what you're going to do is you're going to create predicted values from that regression. Okay, so you're going to take your point estimates, and then you're going to predict x based off your point estimates, and then you're going to reg reg regress your outcome y on your predicted values, and I'm calling them here x prime. Okay? You guys with me? That's how instruments work. So the key question here is, how does, why does x prime vary? Why do the predicted values here vary? What's causing variation in x prime? Only w. Only w. Right? Because we ran that first stage regression, and the only way that you can get x prime to change is if w gets bigger or gets smaller. Right? So that's, that's the way in which we have now isolated changes in x caused by changes in w. Does that make sense? This is the key. Instruments are all about isolating variation, and this is how it works. Okay, so here's a classic instrument. All right? What's the effect of going, uh, the question is, what's the effect of going to the military on earnings? Right? You want to know, okay, I want to be rich later in life. Should I go to the military? That's the question. Now, what's the problem? The problem is people self-select into the military. Right? So if you compare people who go to the military and people who don't, you may, be, you may, you may get messed up because there could be some selection bias. Right? So you might ask the question, do those who select out of the military, those who don't go to the military, do they really reflect the right counterfactual outcomes for those who do go? Right? That's the question you're going to ask. Now, uh, so how, how could you use an instrument here? So you need to find an instance in which something affects military attendance, right, participation, but not future earnings, except through the military attendance. Yes, exactly. So the answer is the draft lottery. So in the Vietnam War, they had a draft. And certain, you get a number based on your birthday. And some people get selected, and some people don't get selected based purely on their draft numbers, which were randomly assigned. OK, so you have something here which causes you to get forced to go into the military. right? But some people, by pure randomness, don't have to go. So you can isolate the variation in who goes to the military based on the draft lottery. And that's just a random event. Okay, and this is the paper, Angris 1990, that thought of this. And Josh Angris, of course, is one of the pioneers in this. Anyone know the answer? Is military good or bad using this approach? Earnings of military uh, uh, members who are randomly pushed into the Vietnam War are 15% less than those who, uh, who, who did not go. Okay. Not good, I guess, if you're, I mean, not only do you have to go to war, now you suffered at earning losses as well. OK, so, uh, so what I want to do briefly is just run through a few key issues with instruments. OK, so uh, first, I want to just run through this very simple um, Monte Carlo that we've already set up. But now I'm just going to adjust the data generating process to include uh, the W term. OK, so what I'm going to do is include here the W up here. And again, there's no W in the second stage. And so what I'm going to change then and this very simple expression is I'm going to run my, my regression, my, my instrument of error regression, which is basically doing this process. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change A2. What is A2? A2 is the strength of the first, what we call the first stage, the relationship between x and w. Right? So if, w, uh, if A2 was 0, there'd be, no, there'd be no first stage. If A2 is 1, it's small. If, if A2 is 3, it's, it's going to be stronger. Okay. And so what I've done here is I've shown you, this is the, uh, again, the Monte Carlo estimates from doing this instrument of variable regression. Again, the true value is the same. The true value is 1, right? 
If we do this with a weak first stage, what do you notice versus having a very strong first stage where the relationship is strengthened? What do you see? We have greater dispersion when you have a weaker first stage, right? It's quite dispersed. You could get a lot of things, right? And again, that we have not violated the exclusion restriction. We, we still don't have a W here. You could, get, you could get something really small or you could get something really large. Again, how do you know if you got something really small? You don't. You only get one, right? There's only one estimate and one sample. And so if you have a, if you have a, a weak first stage, you could really you could get really noisy stuff. Okay? And it's going to get even worse when we, when we violate the exclusion restriction, now, as, as we'll do in a moment. When we have a strong first stage, you can see here we're pretty close to the truth. Okay? Now, what could go awry? When do, when do instruments actually make things worse? Well, the way the instruments make things worse is if you allow, or if, it, if, the, truth, if the truth is that this W term affects the outcomes that you care about through any other means except through x. And the reason is because the way we do the instrument is we are attributing all of the changes in w to y, and we're going to attribute all of that to x. And what happens is if w affects y independent of x in some way, shape, or form, we're going to misattribute the, the causal effect of x. Okay? We, so we call this, this is the exclusion restriction, that w cannot, if, you, if instruments are going to be valid, w cannot affect y except through x. Okay? So let's go back to our Monte Carlo and let's say, let's do this. Let's see what happens. Let's violate our own you know, setup. So what we do here is I've now added uh, to the second stage of our data generating process, I've added w. So now w has a direct effect on y. Now, of course, I can make b3 0 so that that effect actually goes away, or I can make b3 large. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to play around. I'm going to run the same Monte Carlo. And we're going, to see what, we're going to see what happens here. Okay, But before we do, so now let's ask this question. So why does x prime vary? Still only because of w. Right? But now, why does y vary in response to w? Why does y vary? Exactly. The direct path and the indirect path. And the instrument is going to associate all of that with x. And that's what's going to cause us to be screwed up. Okay. So, so here's, here's what the results look like. So let me let just B3 be 0. When B3 is 0, there's no problem. Right? The exclusion restriction is hold because that term uh, in the second stage just drops out. But if it's positive, then what happens? So here we go. So when B3 is 0, uh, the instrument uh, estimates are, are, are close to 1. Right? We're good. When B3 is not 0, we're up to 2. Right? When B3 is 3, we, we're, we're biased again. Right? Now, it gets even worse. What if you have a weak first stage versus a strong first stage? Right? So uh, how much time do I have? I think, oh, we're, we're close there. OK. So it turns out that uh, if you have a weak first stage, so that, that the very first graph I showed you here, where A2 was 1. A2, again, is the relationship between, uh, between W and X. If that's weak, then any violation of the exclusion restriction gets magnified. And if that relationship is strong, it's not as bad. Still bad, not as bad. So here is, I'm showing you some box plots here. So now um, the way to think about this is I'm going to let B3 be 0. This means there's no violation of the exclusion restriction. This is a moderate violation, B3 equals 3, and then a really strong violation. right? And for the two graphs, what I've been looking at here is a weak first stage and a strong first stage. And again, the truth here is the dotted line. The truth is 1. So if we, if we just start off with a very strong first stage, right? so w and, and x are very strongly related to each other, you can see that as I violate the exclusion restriction, as I go from b3 equals 0 where there's no violation, you can see I'm, I'm right on 1 here, but it gets worse and worse, uh, and I get up to like 2.5. But if I have a weak first stage, look at, what ha look at what happens. You can see it goes from 2 all the way up to 4, and then all the way up to 6. Right? So, and the reason that happens is because the, the first stage is captured in the denominator of the, of the instrumental variable regression. And so if this is really small, if there's really low correlation here, it's going to blow this term up. And that's what's happening. OK, so let me talk briefly about the other issues here. So how, how do you, so this is, this is the end of the econometric. So you did it. 
Thank you. I know we rushed a little bit at the end, but hopefully it was clear. So what are the other issues here? So the first is, how do you know if your first stage is strong enough? What is strong enough? I mean, I've shown you some numbers and that it could be bad, but how do you know in a practical sense? Right? How can I check if my estimates are sensitive to a violation of the exclusion restriction? You can't actually test the exclusion restriction. So how, can you, how do you know if you're in the clear or not? Right? What if only a certain part of the population rest, uh, responds to the instrument? So for example, the draft lottery is a great instrument, but it only applied to certain people. Right? It only applied to young people who were eligible for the draft. Do you think that that effect would also hold for old people? Right? This is what we call a, a local average treatment effect. The instrument only applies to the people who respond to W. Right? Some people may not respond. And so what we're identifying, the comparison we are, we are using is we're comparing the people who respond to W right, versus people who don't, people who change because W changes. And that may not be everybody. So this is what Josh Angrist and Steve Michigan called the local average treatment effect, that your estimates are coming from a very specific part of your population. And there could be different effects for different parts of the population. That, that's what late is local average treatment effect. OK. And finally, there's a recent uh, literature in economics and, and management about how do you estimate uh, the extent to which the omitted variables would need, uh, how strong would they need to be to overturn my estimates? So like, you estimate what you have. You, don't have a, you, you know there's some omitted variables, but how strong would they really have to be to kill my estimate or reverse it? Right? And there's some estimate, there's some approaches here that are, that are uh, relatively new in the last few years that are doing that. Okay, I don't have time to cover all this stuff, but we do in class. All right, so, uh, so what do we do here in this, in this full course? We take this simple approach, and I call this simple because there was no matrix algebra. Basically, it's called variance and variance operations. Uh, and, we, and we do this with each of the bad hombres. And then we do it with each of the bigly methods. And so, um, and so it's a really, you know, hopefully you can see the value in, in, in doing this approach. You have a very good understanding of when things are work, when they don't work, uh, and, um, uh, and what, what you could do about it. And so just finally to, to advertise here, we're, we're running a boot camp for the first time based on all this material. It's a two and a half day boot camp from June 8th to 10th uh, uh, this, uh, this summer in College Park, Maryland. Uh, it's the very best methods boot camp ever. And, um, and it's, it's geared towards uh, first and second year strategy PhD students that we welcome PhD students from all varieties. And again, our goal here is to really help train the next generation of, uh, of management scholars. So if you want to apply, you can email uh, the best methods at RH Smith that umd.edu that we do have an email address which is pretty cool uh, or you could just email me if you're interested and uh, and that's it